Um, my name is Alina Nitschik. The title of the book is Ukraine vis a vis uh, Russia and the EU uh, Misperceptions uh, of Foreign Challenges in Times of War, and it's about the first year of the war, 2014 15. And yeah, you can see the picture as well. And the idea was uh, with me from the start of uh, annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass and uh, previously uh, being a bachelor or master student, student I was working on EU, Ukraine, Russia relations and this Ukraine foreign policy and Ukraine being between uh, East and West and I was working on this team uh, uh, from different perspectives. And then I was finishing my master thesis, which was about uh, Ukraine's integration into the European Union. And then uh, at that moment, Russia annexes Crimea and the war starts in Donbass. And obviously I was shocked as everybody else. And um, I was thinking how uh, um, international community and the world failed to stop this and uh, to, to bring uh, to justice. So I was looking for different opportunities to develop this research further. And uh, uh, in the meantime, I was also working in Brussels uh, as a practitioner, organizing different events uh, to support Ukraine. And then somehow I found this uh, PhD position and uh, I started um, studying um, different literature on the EU-Ukraine-Russia relations on Ukraine and uh, it struck me that um, there was not so much literature, there was almost no literature on Ukraine itself, on Ukraine's foreign policy. And uh, uh, scholars talking about uh, this Russian-Ukrainian war, they were either, either talking about uh, EU-Russia relations or the West-Russia relations uh, in context of this war. But no one was looking at Ukraine, at the Ukraine sub subjectivity. And I thought, yeah, I can uh, still look at the war and uh, at the European Union's response, but I can look at it from Ukraine's perspective, how Ukraine was acting and reacting in this. And that could be my big contribution because uh, in all this research previously, Ukraine was just an object and some place was this, uh, was this war between East and West was happening. And I thought I look at Ukraine's foreign policy and I study it, I study its development. Uh, so book, uh, obviously the theme is this first year of the war, 2014-15. But in one chapter I'm looking uh, comprehensively at the whole um, history of Ukraine's foreign policy in relations with the EU and Russia starting from Ukraine's independence. So uh, I wanted to, uh, to study how Ukraine was itself uh, reacting and uh, Ukraine's relation, uh, relations with Russia and the European Union and to see the um, development of Ukraine's foreign policy, some failures and so to understand it better and to offer some possibilities for its development. And uh, you know, interestingly, by now I'm still working on this topic with um, uh, different research and uh, still in the current situation and with everything that happened, still majority of people looking at EU, Russia, West Russia relations and still there is no so, so much research on Ukraine's foreign policy exactly as a topic. So I, I was looking, uh, I was thinking how to analyze um, Ukraine's foreign policy and I was interested in uh, uh, in rational, uh, rational choice theories and game theory and I also saw that here theoretically there is some uh, space for contribution because uh, also uh, in this way how I applied it for uh, uh, foreign policy analysis uh, game theory was not used so I'm, I'm not um, offering some crazy mathematical models I just um, uh, read uh, through uh, game theory literature and they chose four elements which is most common and I divide the decision making uh, procedure into these four elements. So I divide uh, Ukraine's foreign policy makers um, decision making into uh, first it's information, trust, payoffs and resources. So first I look um, when in one particular interaction uh, which information Ukrainian decision makers had on pref of preferences of uh, Russia and European Union. Then I look uh, at their trust in, um, so it's not only in positive way to trust, but, tr but trust in decision, uh, in, uh, in strategies. 
So if Russia is saying that we are going to annex Crimea, it's also negative trust how, if they were trusting in this, if they trust this information. Then I look at payoffs. So if they analyze one particular interaction, for example, again, if we look at Crimea, if they analyze this interaction, which uh, something happened in Crimea. So what were payoffs, the end results for European Union, for Russia, for Ukraine? That's the third element and the fourth elements were resources. Resources, but so also not only available resources, but resources uh, available to be used here. So, and then if you look at the EU and Russia, uh, Russia had resources and it was ready to use them. So it's not also readiness, your preparedness to use resources. EU had resources, but EU wasn't ready to use them to apply them in Ukraine in 2014. So it's also part of resources. And uh, I have the whole chapter explaining um, this uh, my game theory approach to foreign policy analysis. And uh, my uh, research also was more uh, qualitative based. So I did interviews. I did interviews with uh, policymakers uh, and experts uh, uh, from EU, Ukraine, Russia, and they analyzed also documents and trans transcripts of meetings. So in political science, yes, you, can, you cannot say, uh, say anything for sure. Then the, what, how, how do you do research? How, how, how do you make any conclusions? You, uh, what I was doing, I was uh, diversifying my data. So I was, I was talking with uh, someone from European Commission and with Ukrainian politicians. I was, uh, I was thinking what, who was saying what. Uh, I, was, I was looking at, at different available data at, uh, in, uh, at uh, media reports, transcripts of meetings, and uh, I was analyzing then, uh, I was talking with people from uh, different political parties and so that uh, to, uh, to have uh, the most diverse available information. That's one thing. Another thing that I was doing my interviews um, eight, no, four, four years after that happened, after this first year of the war, and then more information will become available. For instance, you know this um, transcript of uh, Ukrainian Security Council meeting before annexation of Crimea. So that beca it became available a few years after this happened. So with years, uh, more information become available and people uh, also, they were saying at that time in, uh, in spring 2014, so I remember talking with uh, Ukraine's um, foreign minister at that time, uh, the Shchitsa, and he said, yeah, at that time in, in spring, yeah, I thought that Russia wanted this. But then in one year, I understood that no, I was mistaken. So, you know, when you talk with people uh, about the past, they already have more information. They understand that at that moment when they were reacting, and also that was a very difficult situation, you know, with everything happening, the change of power in Ukraine and, um, and Russian aggression, people were actually in stress. But then after a few months or a few years, they see already more things and they have better understanding. So that also helped that I talk with them uh, sometime afterwards. And they had already, because uh, as a policymaker, they are also doing their own kind of analysis, how they reacted and why. And then uh, they had already better understanding and they could tell me that yeah, at that time I did not have this information, you know, yeah, we could not understand this. And then later, we understood. for instance, I can give you an example. Uh, when the annexation of Crimea was happening, many people mentioned that the European Union said, um, do not do anything, we will solve this with Russia. And Ukrainians mentioned that that was one of the reasons that Ukraine did not react. Of course, there were other reasons they were afraid they didn't have enough resources and there was um, Euromaidan just finished, but one of the reasons, and we see this also in, uh, in the transcript of this Ukrainian Security Council, one of the reasons they trusted, okay, let us wait, EU will help us to solve the situation. But then annexation Crimea is happening and uh, and they shocked EU promised to help, EU did not help. Then the situation is happening in Donbass and then they already, and the EU is saying no, no, don't react. But then Ukrainians say no, no, now we are going to react because we already saw, we trusted you. That was this issue of trust and they trusted that the EU will help. But then they learned no, EU did not help. And then they, they already updated the information and trust. So when you see this in perspective, then people can explain better what information they had at that moment and uh, how, uh, how it changed. And in Ukraine, there, there are and there were issues in, uh, in politics and uh, in foreign policy. You obviously know there are different things like uh, corruption or 
uh, unprofessionalism. Also, I found there was um, this issues with uh, transfer of information between the change of political elites. Also, a few people said that every time, after every revolution, after every change of power, there was uh, there were just uh, the new power was getting rid of all the professionals from previous uh, from previous power. Yes, the civil servants, everyone. And then you don't have this transfer of information from before, right? I mean, obviously, when there was Euromaidan and some people were supportive of Yanukovych and were pro-Russian, obviously, you get rid of these people. But you need some people on the... And this example there was about Ukraine Security Service. That is a relevant institution, right? And I was told that when, uh, after Euromaidan, uh, the new chief uh, came there, it was the building was almost empty. Everyone left. How can you build something there? How you can react then to uh, to Russian aggression? So um, I mean that uh, that is one of, of many issues. So and uh, obviously Ukraine is uh, relatively new, uh, re relatively new the de democracy, right? And uh, obviously you did not have such built and uh, comprehensive. Uh, uh, foreign policy and institutions, everything like you have in more developed dem democracies like in US, right? So uh, there are many things which are influencing this. And uh, another thing that uh, politicians, as they do in other countries, they uh, care sometimes more about themselves, about their further elections than about, about the country. And that's also it makes sense that decisions are not perfectly in line with preferences of the whole country and preferences of all Ukrainians. Obviously, we have oligarchic influences on decision making. So it was not always like all Ukrainian decision makers were sitting and thinking how we can better decide so that to make the best for the whole of Ukraine, for the whole Ukrainians. That was not always the case, 100%. If we compare again with this perfect decision making. The first chapter is, is theory, it's an uh, explanation of how I apply uh, this game theory approach uh, to foreign policy analysis and uh, so it's more uh, theoretical, I would say uh, it would be more interesting uh, for scholars. Uh, the second uh, the uh, second chapter is the history of EU-Ukraine-Russia relations and uh, I would say uh, almost everyone could learn something from this chapter, <laughs> uh, even people who know Ukrainian history well, because when you, I was trying to put it all together and to concentrate on Ukraine's decision making, and so when you see it all together, so maybe some of, ah, yes, yes, it exactly happened then, and yes, this decision making was, and uh, and then it's like a preparation for what is happening uh, when uh, Russia decides on next Crimea and uh, starts the war in Donbass, then you see that, ah, there was a situation in Tuzla, right? And the war could have, have happened then. And then Kuchma was able to meet with Putin. Yes, so, uh, you know, it just helps you. And the people who do not know Ukraine and who, uh, who read the book, they said, yeah, it was very much eye-opening because um, the second chapter is a history. When you want to decide on something, you look which information you have about if you, if you have interaction with other uh, people or states. You look what, uh, which information I have about preferences, what these people mainly want. Then you look how much I trust in their strategies, how they want to react. Then you look, okay, in this interaction that I'm going to have with them, what are their payoffs, what they're going to have at the end, and what are their resources, how much they want, uh, how uh, they will um, uh, try to uh, to achieve these uh, payoffs, these resources. Uh, so basically, it's uh, explanation of normal uh, decision making, and you can name it differently, of course, all these elements, as I said. Uh, and uh, I found these elements myself in game theory literature, and I, I grouped them and uh, uh, yeah, built this model. Uh, and uh, I, I never, I never saw it in, in other research. In my research, I was looking at the at EU, yeah, EU, Ukraine, Russia. I was not so much looking at US, but uh, the same instructions were from EU, as, as I said. A number of policymakers who were in direct contact with uh, EU policymakers, I said, yes, EU said, no, don't do anything. But also, yeah, there were, uh, we have this transcript of uh, uh, Security Council meeting. There were different discussions, and only Turchino wanted uh, 
uh, wanted somehow to, to fight uh, for, uh, uh, for Crimea and others uh, said, uh, no, we cannot do it, we don't have enough resources, uh, let us wait. I think Timoshenko was saying, uh, let us wait for you, let us, uh, let us see what is happening. Then I must say something, um, something new for you and for listeners. One of my interviewees, who was former um, uh, former ambassador of one of uh, European countries uh, uh, to Ukraine, he said that at one meeting uh, with uh, Ukrainian officials, uh, he uh, he heard that uh, uh, when everything was happening in Crimea, Turchino uh, wanted uh, to take. Uh, a plane to Crimea and to go there and to speak directly to people. And then uh, he got a phone call from uh, from Russia that if he was to do it, then his plane would be shut down. And uh, I mean, uh, it's only one person telling me this, uh, so I, I don't know whether it was true, but something interesting. So uh, you have this always uh, blackmail, intimidation from Russians, yes, so you can assume, yeah, it may be the truth. But uh, that would may, may have changed. You, you had the same situation in Donbass, yes? So if Ukrainian politicians were, came there and talked to these people, to, to Ukrainians, yes? Uh, so some, some Ukrainians as well. So uh, at least them would then uh, be uh, against everything that was happening. And then Russians, uh, Russian instructors would, wouldn't have that success. But that did not happen. That didn't happen in Crimea. No one from Ukrainian new powers, uh, new power was going there. And what uh, what Crimeans heard, you know, this Russian propaganda, there are Nazis in Kiev, you know, and uh, so there were many, many different situations where you can think, of, okay, if that happens, that would ca that that could change something, right? M many EU politicians were actually saying that uh, some of Ukrainian decision makers were not the most prominent and uh, how they could not understand. Oh, many were actually saying uh, it's interesting, even um, Stefan Fule, former uh, commissioner on enlargement, uh, he was saying, uh, and also former uh, um, President of European Council, uh, Herman Van Rompuy, they both said that Yanukovych actually wanted to sign this association agreement, uh, but uh, he did not understand uh, the consequences of this for his rule, for oligarchs, for the whole system. But he uh, really believed he wanted to do it. And then, and then you see that uh, if these people who were talking with him many times, and they say this, then uh, you see the, uh, how, how much of this Russian, uh, Russian pressure was there and uh, why it all started. So how he was pushed by Russia then to change his opinion and but by all this influ Russian influence in Ukraine. And uh, that was, uh, I mean, you can assume this, of course, but then when these people who were actually there and they say it, then you see it was actually, yes, Russia was, Russia was there, Russia was the, the, mo the, main, uh, uh, the main aggressor from the beginning, right? So to, to invite more uh, professional people, to trust them, to, uh, to invite scholars, to listen to scholars, to listen, uh, to learn from, uh, uh, from better foreign policies, like from more developed countries uh, and uh, to, to analyze everything, not to... You could, also, Ukrainians were very much concentrated um, on what they want. So I also discovered this lack of analysis uh, of what EU want and uh, and what Russia wanted, Ukrainians were a bit, a bit like children shouting, like we want this now, and the EU is incapable, and everybody is. Uh, but uh, that's not foreign policy. In foreign policy, you are discussing, you are trying to uh, to offer the other side something. You uh, are, yeah, you try to say, yeah, uh, we we can we can do this, and you can this, uh, you can you can convince others with arguments that you uh, why they need to support you because it's for your benefit, yes. And you you convince, you discuss, you make compromises. That's what you do in foreign policy. And uh, also, uh, a few people told me that. Uh, before uh, this Russian uh, attack in 2014, Ukraine did not have strategic foreign policy at all. So it was only uh, it was it's only opinion of a few, a few people. I mean, uh, 
because before it was only transactional relations. Okay, we buy something, we sell something, but they don't build in the strategy of relations with countries, they were not analyzing other countries, what was their interest, what you can offer them, why should they be interested in you? Yes, it's not that everybody uh, everybody need to help you, everybody need to, uh, to, to do what you want. So if you want this and convince them in this. And actually I'm doing now further research. My current research is why you got uh, you can that country status. And even some Ukrainian diplomats are saying that before we did not have strategies of relations with some even European countries. And uh, so it's very interesting. And again, yes, Ukraine, uh, there are many justifications. Ukraine had always a threat from Russia and you cannot just, you cannot work on everything. Ukraine is a young democracy, of course, but uh, I mean, uh, you need to understand uh, where you need to go for, right? You need to understand how you can develop, how do you can build more professional, more uh, beneficial foreign policy for a country. Yes, obviously there is a certain development of, uh, of Ukraine's uh, foreign policy, Ukraine's institutions. Uh, one of the things now, now you see, uh, even with my uh, research on the candidate country status, I saw huge involvement of new actors in foreign policy, civil society, Ukrainian diaspora, and their role was huge in even such things as getting candidate country status. Even that this uh, questionnaire was written uh, by volunteers, not by professionals from uh, foreign ministry, but uh, by uh, volunteers from different NGOs. Uh, so. Um, but that's good that Ukrainian state is already allowing volunteers, right, the NGOs and civil society to get involved and to get help uh, where they need this help. And uh, yeah, business and uh, so we, we see this already, um, uh, yeah, something that is less visible on examples of other countries. There is normally a foreign policy and there are actors who are doing this and in Ukraine now the whole of Ukraine, everybody is involved there and uh, that's, uh, that's amazing and uh, that would be better if these prominent people uh, get actually official positions, right, and then that they have more, uh, more influence. But that is, uh, of course, uh, changing something and uh, for instance, this, uh, uh, that Ukrainians fulfilled this uh, you questionnaire in, in 10 days. That was amazing and that would not be possible without involvement of Ukrainian civil society. Now everyone's research is dealing with Ukraine a bit. These people who are working on security in general, on wars, on European studies, they all they have this Russian-Ukrainian war and they all study a bit. So now, you know, everybody became an uh, expert on Ukraine. And uh, for instance, now in, in Switzerland, I see always this interviews of people who were working uh, young know, conflicts in Africa and they commented on some particular situation in Ukraine or, you know, some scholars working on Russian literature, they can also be invited to give interview on BBC about the war, you know, so now everybody's becoming a specialist and uh, influencer um, on, the, on this war and everybody's research is a bit a bit related to this and uh, uh, we saw opening of new uh, Ukrainian studies also uh, and the new uh, institutes dealing uh, with Ukraine we see that this uh, previously uh, Russian pre previously Russian studies are becoming already Eastern European studies and Ukraine is getting there we see we see professorships uh, on Ukraine and uh, yeah, so it's changing a bit already. And you, yeah, so my many scholarship for Ukrainians and everything. So uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the science working on Ukraine, that, that this war was very beneficial. I, I, I did this actually for, for the Swiss army. <laughs> I was invited uh, to teach about Ukraine's history for the Swiss army uh, and uh, they wanted just the history of Ukraine-Russia relations uh, starting from the 20th century. But I convinced them that no, that doesn't show you the whole picture. <laughs> I wanted to speak about the Kiev rules, I wanted to speak about the Cossacks, and I wanted to speak not about Ukraine-Russia, but EU-Ukraine-Russia. 
And this shows you, I mean, this hist uh, course on Ukraine's uh, uh, foreign policy history. This shows you not only Ukraine, this whole shows you Europe and Russia, this explains you the whole continent and uh, explains you the formation of countries' foreign policy and uh, which you can apply for other situations around the world foreign policy. And I taught this course, uh, it wasn't a course, so just one hour lecture, and I showed uh, this, the most important element, and I chose Holodomor, right? And Holodomor, what Holodomor shows? Holodomor shows why you had so many Russians in, uh, in Donbass, yes? And uh, why you had the majority of Russians in Crimea, because Stalin deported and killed Crimean Tatars, yes? It was not that Russians were there for centuries, yes? It's not this, it's not the story. Crimea belonged to uh, to Turkey much longer than it belonged to Russia. And you cannot, you cannot teach it with a, a 20th century history. So I explained all of this. And you know the first question I, which I got? Yeah, yeah, we know, but, but we see this in news that there are some Nazi in Ukraine. Are there some Nazi in Ukraine? I mean, Ukraine as, as a new country and being in such geopolitically difficult uh, position, between east and west, south and north, uh, it has a lot of challenges and obviously with uh, different presidents and revolutions and uh, uh, with uh, challenges of uh, uh, institutions building, democracy building, uh, uh, the country couldn't concentrate on everything. Uh, even another example, we have this historical issues with polls. And Poles in Poland, uh, this research uh, exists. So they managed to count the number of uh, people killed, uh, and uh, and Ukrainians just don't have resources and funding. And uh, Ukrainians thinking now there is invasion. Before it was something happening. We just have other issues to do, right? And and we have, but that's important for our important partner in Europe. Right, so we need to do this also, this um, not so global, but a small thing is to, to solve this issue with Poles and to, to allow Ukrainian researchers to work together with Poles. But uh, Poles are better, they can better argue, argue in this issue because they made their research. Ukrainians did not. We had other problems, right? We had the 90s and the revolutions and we have Russian invasion. We have other problems. We cannot think about this past uh, a few years, but they were relevant for Poland. You see, so uh, they are better prepared. They, uh, they, uh, they have uh, time and money to, to do this. And then they made this film. I lived them in Poland when they made this film, Volin, and uh, everybody was looking, oh my God, that's uh, scary Ukrainians. 2014, it was also after Euromaidan. So uh, a lot of external uh, external issues was play, were playing against Ukraine, right? Uh, on which Ukraine, Ukraine did not have any influence. But looking only at Ukraine's foreign policy, I also found a few a few issues like uh, corruption and professionalism and poor analysis of foreign interlocutors, which also uh, somehow contributed to this worse outcome for Ukraine. So uh, what I want readers to get is some um, thoughts, some insights how to work further on development of Ukraine's research and on development of better, more professional Ukraine's foreign policy. So as the last year, uh, I did research on why EU granted Ukraine EU candidate country status. Uh, it's, uh, I hope the article will be published soon. And now I'm working on development of Ukraine's foreign policy post uh, 2022nd. So this is what, what we, you were asking, <laughs> exactly. I have not done interviews yet, uh, uh, but uh, as for my this previous research on why Ukraine got EU candidate country status, I already saw uh, some uh, improvements, how Ukrainians were advocating for this candidate country status better and uh, uh, some uh, decisiveness of Ukrainian politicians, so the end of Ukraine's East-West policy, that was also one of the issues through the history that Ukraine could not decide for itself. Ukrainian politicians and Ukrainian population. And then after 2022nd, we have this shift. So yeah, we go west. No, no way to go to Russia. That's one of the improvements, for example. 
Uh, so this picture uh, was painted by uh, one talented painter from my home city, from Sume. And uh, you, you can see his name and his website in the introduction of the book. Uh, he paints very allegorical pictures and uh, I, I was once at his exhibition in Sume and I follow him on Facebook. And I was thinking what, um, what picture I can have for my book. You want to have something interesting, not just Ukrainian flag, you know? You want something uh, unusual. And I said, oh, maybe I contact him. And so I wrote to him and said, yeah, maybe you can uh, paint a picture from my book. And he uh, agreed to do this. And I told him the idea that it's Ukraine vis-a-vis uh, -vis EU and Russia and this game theory. And so, and so he did it. So you see, you see here Ukraine, right? The hetman. You see, you see, you, you know who is it. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can uh, guess it's Putin. You see that he has a knife here, so he's playing uh, not fair. You see this nuclear that he also has nucle nuclear threat, and you see that like game theories that uh, they, they are playing, right? And that was his idea to put you here, because um, that's. Um, research on EU, Ukraine, Russia, but you see EU are somehow not equal, not at the table. And uh, because he saw them as many Ukrainians at the time that Ukraine, that EU did not do enough, EU did not go, uh, get involved. And in 2014-15 it was actually true that EU were like shadows, staying there, watching and still some sanctions, but we still continue business with Russia. And now it's a bit changing. After um, after 2022nd, uh, after this invasion, you could already get a chair, right, at this table. But at that time, you were still just this shadow staying there and on the Ukrainian side, yes, supporting, not supporting. So it was his idea, but it's very interesting. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you again for your interest in my book.